Self-publishing. It's a big scary word. A big scary three words. It's a big scary concept. It's a lot of steps. It's a lot of know-how. It's a lot of things that go into it. And today I'm going to walk you through everything that you need to know to successfully self-publish your book. So let's get into it. I forgot to say while standing at my cute little wall that this uh, video was Patreon voted. So if you want to be a part of the Patreon and let me know what video ideas and things you want to see and learn about, uh, hop over there. It's a fun time. So first I'd like to get into my credentials, why I'm qualified to talk about this, and also shamelessly promote my debut novel, Burnish. I'm using a lamp so you can see the lamp lights, but this is Burnish. It is my debut novel. I love this book so much with my whole heart and soul. I wrote it. I edited it myself. I had my mom proofread it because she has the eyes of a hawk and it, it really was, it, I, the only thing that I outsourced was these chapter drawings at the beginning of each chapter from my cousin, who is an amazing, excellent artist. So. Oh, look, they're so good. Pyre's little sewing box, shut up. I have formatted this book. I'm a graphic designer, so I also created the cover, all of this stuff. So if you want to check it out, bit.ly, bit.ly, <laughs> bit.ly slash burnish book. But yeah, this is my, my little uh, labor of love that I created. It came out back in December of 2022. It's a dark fantasy tragedy, so if you're interested in reading it, go peep the link, okay? I don't know what else to say, but I am gonna teach you guys the ins and outs of the process that I used, as well as some things that I've learned through other numerous sources on how other authors have self-published their own books and um, the resources they've used and the paths they've gone through, because something fun about self-publishing, but also sometimes overwhelming, is that you really can choose your, it's a, it's a choose your own adventure. Yeah. Um, so let's, uh, it's almost midnight. Let's get into our steps. Also, welcome to Glasses Nat. I usually wear glasses, if you didn't know, but I usually take them off when I'm filming because I don't love this reflection. But I recently have gotten pretty tired of that because when I do <laughs> these videos, they usually have some kind of script or bullet point outline for me to follow. And I have to make the font size 20 times bigger than uh, it normally would be for me to see it without my glasses. And, I also typically, in the, in the past few videos, have been holding my computer or a script, and my computer now is new and it's way too heavy to hold. Um, so I'm just gonna glance over there occasionally, and that is why you have glasses now. Before we get into our steps, I forgot <laughs> that I want to talk about the differences between indie and traditional publishing and why I chose to go the indie route. So a few things with traditional publishing that really bother me. Um, they own your book. They own your content, they own the rights to it, they can edit it however they want, they can direct the cover to look however they want, stuff like that. So you kind of lose that creative control. That is a really, really big thing for me is that publishing indie allows you to maintain that control. It's yours from the moment that you start writing it, you sit down to write it, to the moment that it's on shelves. It's your thing. I really don't like that idea of giving up my content to someone else because also once the traditional publisher owns your story, they also own the rights to marketing and distribution, which means if someone wants to make a movie out of your story or something like that, they approach the publisher and not you. And you don't have the rights to decide whether or not, oh yeah, this would be a cool movie or oh no, no thanks. I don't want you guys to butcher my, my book in a film. As a fan of films, I feel bad saying that. But if that's how you feel, that's something, that's a, a right that you may lose with traditional publishing. Publishers, traditional publishers also pick favorites. They'll take a thousand manuscripts, they'll pick 25 to publish, they'll pick three to really push and market. And the amount of marketing you can do outside of that is pretty restricted. It's uh, limited. You are very limited in what you can do once the publisher decides which way they want to go. And if you're not in the in the favorites pile, you might get a little shafted. So the big pros of indie publishing for me, you have more flexibility with the timelines, more flexibility of when everything's happening because it's all you. You're controlling all of it. You're deciding all of it. There's also higher earning potential with royalties, especially depending on what 
distributor you, you choose to go with, what platform you choose to publish on. The timeline can also be faster. So if you want control over your timeline to make it go slower, that's fine. If you want control over your timeline to make it faster, that's also perfectly doable and possible. The publishing process for Burnish itself probably took me about three or four months, which is not very long. Traditional publishers can sometimes draw that out. A little bit of a con with indie is that it is up to you to pay for things like editors and proofreaders and graphic designers. And that can be a big thing that's a pro for traditional publishing is that it's their costs. They're pouring their money into your project. But that is also why they control and own all of it. For more info on this, I'm gonna include a link in the description that gives you a really good breakdown of traditional versus indie publishing. And you can really decide if indie is what you wanna do. But if you do decide that indie is for you, then uh, the rest of this video is for you. So the first step of self-publishing is obviously to write a book, right? You need something to publish. This is a daunting task, but I'm guessing if you're watching this video, you've already done it. So I'm gonna say, all I'm gonna say, I need to drink some water. Water? Hello? All I'm gonna say on this one is that I have a plethora of resources for you on this channel for how to do that. If you don't have ideas, I strongly recommend doing an idea generator or using a prompt. The only problem with that is that prompts are sometimes, all the time, very light on the amount of character that they put into the prompt. Prompts are very plot driven. So if you're using a prompt or a generator for an idea, nothing wrong with that. That's totally okay. Just make sure to really develop your characters because that is the characters are the secret to a great story. So that is step one. Step two of publishing is to self edit. And I cannot emphasize enough how important this step is. Self-editing is magical. It's a little miracle life hack because the more that you edit your work, the more that you will subconsciously begin to change your writing and not change in a, you know, disingenuous way or in a way that's gonna make you lose your style, but in a way that you understand what might crop up later in the editing portion. And so you automatically incorporate that into your writing. A big, huge example for me is that I've self-edited so many books. And uh, now when I write, it's uh, second nature to pay attention to things like character voice or a big, huge one is sentence structure. I will be writing and I will be like, oh, this sentence should probably be a little longer than the last one because we're, we're kind of getting into this repetitive sense of, oh, the sentences are starting to feel the same. Maybe I'll go back and adjust a couple. Maybe I'll make this one longer. You don't want to edit while you write. And what I mean by that is you don't want to get too deep in the weeds with it. You don't want to get too critical of it. You don't want to reach that place where you're treating it like it's done. And so I try to incorporate things I've learned from self-editing in a very neutral way of like, oh, I understand that later I'll probably change around the sentence structure of this scene. So I'm just going to make a sentence a little longer here and I'll probably still have to edit stuff like that in the final edit. but. I will say it has massively reduced the amount of editing that I need to do. As you self edit, you start to incorporate that knowledge a little more into your writing and it improves your skills as a writer and saves you time in the future on editing and costs if you plan to hire an editor because I do edit my own work, but I know that not everybody finds that appealing. A self edit is crucial and I did just barely make a video on how to do a great self edit of your book. It's really not that hard and you can have a professional look at it after and spend more time with it in the editing stage if editing is just not your jam. But I promise that it will make a big difference if you at least do one self edit. Step three of self publishing is alpha and beta readers. Alpha readers, you only need three to five, I would say. Beyond that, it can get a little bit overwhelming. But these guys are people who are also writers, also authors. They're gonna look at your story from a writer reader perspective. Alpha readers aren't always done because sometimes it can be hard to have other writing buddies and people that you know that have time to read your work and stuff like that. But there's lots of research you can do, lots of places to find them if that's something you really want. I only use beta readers for Burnish. So alpha readers, you wanna make sure that they are writers who are, vet them as much as you can to make sure that they are gonna have your best interest in mind and that they are gonna give feedback that's not too heavily biased toward their own perspective, which can be hard when someone's giving feedback, but it can be done. Beta readers, you wanna make sure that you pick people that are very, very close to you, that you really, truly trust, that you believe will give you honest, sincere feedback as just a reader. Beta readers aren't the writer readers. 
they're not approaching it also with an author's perspective, they are just reading it as a reader would. And so that feedback can be really, really invaluable because you are never gonna read your story like a reader would. One of my tips in the editing your book video is to step away from your book and story for a while before you start editing because then you can return with a more objective, fresh, reader-like perspective. But you are the author at the end of the day. You're never going to respond to your story the way a reader would. Um, the twists and turns in Burnish, the mysteries, the way that the stories tie together are never gonna hit me, unfortunately, <laughs> in the same way that they will hit my readers. So beta readers are here to give you feedback as just a reader. And I want you to make sure that they are people that you really truly feel comfortable giving your story to and you can peep this video for what kinds of advice you can take from them, what kinds of advice you can leave to the side when they give it to you. So here are some questions really quick to ask your beta and alpha readers. Alpha readers, you're gonna ask things like, do you feel the plot is moving at a logical and understandable pace? Did any parts of the plot bore you or come across as rushed? Were any parts too long, short, unnecessary, or underdeveloped? What is your favorite part of the book? Why? What is your least favorite part? Why? Is the dialogue between characters natural, flowing, and realistic? Who is your favorite character? Why? Who is your least favorite character and why? Are any of the characters underdeveloped or lacking? As for beta readers, here are some great questions to ask those guys. Do the first five pages make you want to keep reading? If not, why did you lose interest? Which chapter was your favorite and why? Which chapter was your least favorite and why? Was the story easy to follow? Did you feel yourself losing interest at any point? Did any part of the book feel unnecessarily repetitive? I will include a link in the description for more questions to ask alpha and beta readers. And again, you don't always have to take their advice. Sometimes there are gonna be just creative differences because you're two different people that are looking at one creative work and that happens like crazy all the time. <laughs> so just take their advice with a grain of salt. If you really love something, use it. If you really don't love something, you don't have to. This is just, a step where it's great to have other input and insight, but it is ultimately up to you. You are still the author. Step whatever we're on. I forgot to number them in my bullet points. Step four is to get a professional editor. And I would recommend hiring one from maybe a freelance site like Upwork or Fiverr, or you can go look at bookstores in your area, at books that are similar to yours, similar genres, lengths, even similar themes. Or you can go to the library and find books that are similar to yours in those same ways. See if the editors of those books are uh, recent, if they're still working, if they're still hireable. Freelance editors are definitely gonna be the cheaper route. And then the higher end professional editors that you see like Marissa Meyer use are gonna cost more. So it really is up to you and your own budget. That's the beautiful thing also about indie publishing is that it's up to you and your budget. So a lot of this stuff, there's more expensive ways it can be done and cheaper ways it can be done. You just kind of have to finesse it. Get an editor because they see things in ways that you don't. As a working professional editor for the past five years, I love being an editor and I have a very different perspective on authors' works than they do. And the good, the right editor for you will fit like a glove. They will work with you. They will understand where you're coming from. As an editor, one of my biggest values is to never stomp on an author's creative uh, liberties and creative license over what is theirs. So the right editor will suggest things and tell you to make changes that they think are correct. And you know, if you say no, then you say no. But they have a very different perspective coming into your story. They have an understanding of things like flow and style and tone and, and all these different things. I, I just think that they are so crucial and so helpful. So hiring an editor is definitely a very big deal. So do that. Step five is to hire a proofreader. Now, if you have an eagle-eyed mother like I do, then uh, you don't need, need to hire one maybe because maybe you have one in your home <laughs> or in your circles or someone you know who just really can pick out those issues. And you know, even the most high-end New York Times bestsellers have some typos sometimes. It's not unheard of and no one's perfect, but a professional proofreader will really help just iron out everything. This, this is the part where we make it look not indie. Um, that's a big deal, is making it seem like if people see it, you know, they, they will think, oh, this is a professionally, traditionally published novel. Um, and when they flip through it, 
It looks traditionally published. It looks beautifully formatted. Ah, oh, that, that is one of my favorite drawings in the whole book. Come back. Look at it. Oh, it's beautiful. Anyways, the proofreader will help iron out things and just catch things that uh, you will not see, your tired brain will not see. No matter how many times you've edited your book yourself, you're going to miss things. It's just the truth. And our brains have this amazing capability of just correcting things that are actually wrong. And uh, then you realize later that you're like, oh crap, I read that right. And actually it's been wrong the entire five times I read it. Having no typos in your book, no grammar errors with an accidental period or an accidental comma, Stuff like that really just puts it over the line of, you know, some some random person did this and makes it feel like a really high-end professional author did this. And that is the, the goal that we're aiming for. So yeah, proofreaders are very important. And bonus points, if you can format your book, which we'll talk about later, before you get a proofreader, because I did silly things like cut out an entire two lines from one page of my book on accident. And also there was one page of Burnish where there was a Y all the way over here. Like, I'll try and show you. There was a Y like all the way over here and then space, 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 and then it said et. So I should have said yet, but it did not work out that way. So if you can format your book before getting it to a proofreader, I would also recommend doing that because that, you know, they can kind of catch issues like that as well but that's not like a necessary, you don't have to. If you do end up with formatting issues, hopefully your readers will let you know. But yeah, so that is our step five is to get a proofreader. Step six is pretty fun and it is to create your own publishing company, which is not as hard or as daunting as you think. The reason that you might wanna create your own publishing company is because like I said, people will contact the publisher for distribution rights. Now, you're going to have to create your own publishing company if you use a service like Ingram Spark because they make you buy your own ISBNs. And the ISBN number, if you don't know, I should have had this ready. For some reason, I didn't think about it. The ISBN number is that pretty little thing right there. It's basically your book's social security number. It identifies your book as your book. No two books have the same ISBN. You can buy like 10 for $250. I think you can maybe also buy them one at a time as well. And if you just search where to buy ISBNs, there's one general site that sells them and I don't remember what they're called, but it's super easy to get them there. You know, you need one to publish your book. If you use Amazon, Amazon can assign you a free ISBN. In that case, Amazon is the publisher. So they people will not be contacting you for distribution or marketing for your book. I did publish through Amazon because I struggled with Ingram Spark and we'll talk about that in a minute, but I published through Amazon, still used my own ISBN that I purchased and I made a publishing company called Honey and Pine and I made a little logo. And all you have to do to create your own publishing company is go to your state website and register your business with the state. For Utah, where I live, it costs like 22 bucks. I'd be surprised if it cost anyone over 30. What I did is I just set up a DBA, but I said, I'm, I, Natalie, am doing business as Honey and Pine Publishing Co. And um, you can do that, or you can just say, I, Natalie, am doing business as Natalie. And your publishing company can be your name. I wanted to definitely go for that more traditional feeling, professional feeling book that has an actual publishing company and I do intend to publish multiple books. And so I decided to just bite the bullet and kind of create my publishing company, but it is up to you on how you do that. In the end, neither one is necessarily better. I definitely prefer having my own publishing company, but it's up to you. I would just say don't use free ISBNs because you definitely want to be the publisher and owner of your book. That was step seven. I don't know if I said step six, but that was step seven. Step eight is to pick a publishing platform. So the re two really big ones that I know of that I'm gonna suggest right now are Amazon KDP or Kindle Direct Publishing and Ingram Spark. They are pretty equal, I would say, in terms of, you know, uh, marketing. You can do extended distribution on both platforms, which means that your book will get into libraries and bookstores and stuff like that. On Amazon, extended distribution will push your book out to different Amazon sites internationally. So like the Japan Amazon or the Europe Amazon or whatever. And Amazon will also push your book to other sites like Goodreads and all that stuff, different places where your people can buy your book. I don't know if people can actually buy books on Goodreads. I don't think so, but <laughs> they will both distribute your book 
throughout international sites and international stores. It's actually been really cool to see some uh, ads for burnish on sites in like Japanese or like Korean or you know all these cool languages. It's really sick to see. The biggest difference between Amazon and Ingram Spark is that Ingram Spark <sighs> rant incoming is so so um, specific about how their book files are. That's the only way I can say it. You have to have your files very specifically formatted and even very specifically exported. So if you literally export your file in the wrong way, it could be the most gorgeous, perfect file ever, speaking from experience, but if it's not the perfectly correct format, it will reject it. The other thing with IngramSpark is that it costs like $50 to put a print book and an ebook out there. By the way, ISBN side note, different versions of a book require different ISBNs. So like one ISBN is gonna be your print book, one ISBN is gonna be, or your paper, let's say one ISBN is your paperback, one ISBN is your hardback, one ISBN is your audiobook, one ISBN is your ebook. So I would definitely recommend probably buying more than one. But anyways, um, Ingram Spark forces you to use your own ISBN, which I think is good. But then they also charge you $50 to use their platform per book that you put out. And uh, actually I think $50 is for an uh, ebook and a print book, but Amazon is free. And uh, every time that I've published a book with Amazon, I have two books out actually. I have Burnish and a poetry book. And I have family that's published through Amazon KDP and it's just always such a more intuitive and easy process. So I would definitely say go with Amazon. Some people really prefer Ingram Spark though. So you can check it out, you know, feel your way about around both the platforms, it's up to you. I will say something that sucks with Burnish is that I tried out Ingram Spark first. Ingram Spark also takes forever to get you author proofs and a proof. Oh, I'll get you one. A proof looks like this. It has this little bar. It often will say like, sometimes it'll say author proof on the inside. I have so many copies of Burnish. You have to get a proof to make sure that your book is good enough to put out into the world. And uh, Ingram Spark takes forever to get those proofs to you. So it was coming down on the day that I wanted to publish the book. And I, you know, I was like, it was probably a month out, honestly. And I was like, this proof is gonna take two weeks to get here. And then what if I need another one? Cause I need to make some changes. Ingram Spark really just gave me so much heartache. And so I decided to switch to Amazon after that. And because of that switch, because my ISBN was used on Ingram first, I now can't use extended distribution on Amazon, which really, really, truly is devastating. <laughs> so um, I would say go with Amazon, but it is up to you, you decide, because you know, some people really love Ingram Spark. So just, you know, use discretion. Step nine is to design your book to make it pretty. <laughs> I love this step. This step is so satisfying, especially as a graphic designer. Oh, I loved it. So let me tell you what I did with Burnish. With Burnish, I designed all of the interior, all of the pages, all of the text in Adobe InDesign. And there are very specific ways that you wanna design a book, like, you know, the left side always has your name, the right side always has the name of the book, stuff like that. Adobe InDesign is really nice because you can import all kinds of fonts from the Adobe site. So you can really, really, really customize it. And you can either learn Adobe InDesign yourself or you can hire someone to do it. Learning it, if you wanna go that route, is not hard. It might be a little challenging, but it's nothing you, nothing you can't do, okay? So if you want to format your own book, I would definitely recommend Adobe InDesign. However, there are also other platforms that will format your book for you. I just find them to not be as customizable as I would like. And, um, you know, if you wanna mess around with words on the page and really make things pop and really make it look how you want to, some platforms wouldn't even let me insert these little like chapter images that I have. So to me, that was a no-go, but to you, if you feel like your book could be a good fit, there are some automated platforms that you just paste your book in there and they will pop out a format. As for the exterior, either learn Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop or uh, hire a graphic designer. So I'll go the first, the DIY route first. Uh, I did design everything burnish. So I just grabbed these uh, formats, like it's very specific, all the measurements, because this is a six by nine book. So all the measurements for this stuff and this stuff, you know, and exactly where this needs to be uh, is very specific. It can be a little tough to figure out, 
even for me, a certified graphic designer, I was like, what am I doing? But it's figure outable, you know? And as for where to get the things that you design with, I just got all of these from Adobe. So this snake and crown is an Adobe asset, an Adobe stock picture. This fire is an Adobe stock picture. I did have to mess around with the snake and crown a lot to brighten up this crown area and darken the snake area to kind of create that contrast that I was going for and to make sure that these this fire in the back really popped. So you can design your own book or your own exterior, or you can hire a graphic designer. Hiring a graphic designer I would say Reedsy is a really great resource. They have lots of book designers on there and lots of really, really good ones too. And some book designers are so cool because they can illustrate their own stuff and I'm, it's fine. When you hire a graphic designer, no matter what route you go, I know someone who, one moment. Where is it? Okay, tragically, I cannot find my print copy of this book, but it's called The Foreseen Three, written by a close friend of mine. And she found her designer on Upwork. So there are lots of different places you can find designers. When you do find a designer, it's very important to have source material. Find book covers that you really feel speak to you, that you really would like this book cover to look like. Bring assets and images and things that you think, you know, fit what you would like to see on the cover so that your graphic designer has plenty to work with because we can't see into your head as graphic designers. So bringing the vision to us is a big deal and also formatting resources for um, things like the interior and exterior are all over uh, the internet. So just if you're writing a nonfiction, the, uh, the ratios of how big your book is gonna be around here are gonna be a little different. There's also another fiction, I almost said setting, size that's like five by eight instead of six by nine. Um, but whatever you want your book to be, research what, what it maybe should be, research a few good sizes for it, pick one and then just Google formatting resources and you will find them. Step 10, ARC readers. ARC stands for Advanced Reader Copy and these guys get a nearly published book from you in exchange for some kind of review, either on Amazon or you know maybe on their Instagram or their YouTube channel and stuff like that. So you can definitely send your book to bookstagrammers and booktubers that have time or you can just give it to a bunch of close friends and say, hey, please post a review on Amazon for, in exchange for this free copy. These guys are very helpful in just building up the reputability of your story and making it look like something that people want to read and have read. But it's also very helpful because they will also catch the formatting and typo errors that you have in there. So just more, the more eyes that you can get on your story at this point, the better. So you can have as, as many ARCs as you want, really. Keep in mind that we're no longer in the uh, feedback phase. So if the ARC readers have an issue, they'll probably tell you. And you can probably maybe see if you wanna work it in, but I strongly suggest that you keep your editor on speed dial and discuss things like that with them. And uh, you're gonna have to reformat a bunch of stuff if you change things at this point. It's just exhausting. So it really is up to you. If they bring up a really good point that you wish you would have used, then you can go and do it. But yeah, a lot of this stuff is up to you. That was step 11. I can't count. I really should have numbered this script. Oh, and also if you want further info on ARC readers and what they are and what to do and where to find them, uh, I will have a link in the description for that as well. Step 12 is marketing. Marketing can begin anywhere from three to six months before your published date and kind of just goes on forever. And there are a few really good ideas when it comes to marketing that you can do. The first one is to send your book to people with presence, people who can get it out there to more people. It's a little bit of a blend between ARC and marketing because if you can get ARC readers that are going to put their reviews in front of a lot of people, that's a great marketing step for you. Word of mouth is by far the greatest marketing tool. And another marketing thing that's good to keep in mind is that you're not marketing to everyone. You're only marketing to your select group of people. You know, people who don't drink matcha, they don't market matcha machines to people who don't drink matcha. So make sure your marketing is targeted to people who are going to understand and hopefully want your book. I would recommend posting all kinds of promotional things on Instagram and YouTube and Twitter and wherever you can post them, Facebook if you still use that. Um, I'm not judging but there are lots of different ideas for promotional uh, things you can make and use. And so I'm going to include a link in the description for that as well. And then one more link in the description for press kits. 
Author press or media kits, I am not familiar with. I did not use one for burnish, didn't make one. I, I can't really speak on it, but I've heard people say it's a good idea, so I'm putting a link in the description as well, and I'm gonna leave the research up to you because I honestly don't know. Your 13th and final step is to publish your book on a Tuesday. For some reason, books come out on Tuesday. <laughs> so you've gone through all of these things, you've done all these 13 steps, and now you're publishing your book, schedule it on a Tuesday. On that Tuesday, throw a little party because you did it. And then uh, 14, ish step is to continue marketing forever because it really marketing is a forever game and uh, that's something that really is really nice about indie publishing is that you have the rights to market it and you can market it in whatever way that you want for as long as you want whenever you want wherever you want <laughs> i love indie publishing it's amazing anyways <laughs> If you found this video helpful, please uh, don't forget to like it and maybe comment if you have something to say. Even if your something to say is just, hey, I love comments. Please share this video to anyone who might find it helpful and please feel free to check out the Patreon. There are some awesome tiers over there and it's a great way to show your support for the content that I am making. But the absolute best way to show your support is just to subscribe and it's free. So there you go. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you are great. You are amazing. Good luck on your self-publishing journey. If you need any help during your self-publishing stuff, you can always contact me. I am a writing book coach and self-publishing is part of the stuff that I coach on. So you can find more info on that on my site and which the link is always in the description to my site. And that is about all the self-promo that I can handle right now. So I will see you guys later. Bye. I say happy trails at the end of my videos. I'll see you guys later. Happy trails.